スロットンシュサタンデーヴ here from Sega Saturn Shiro and today we're pulling from the Shiro archive an interview with Tom Kalinske CEO of Sega of America during the infamous console wars of the early 90s This interview was pulled from February 20th, 2021, at the Long Island Retro Uplink Expo. The Shiro's conducting this interview are myself, Patrick Trainer, Nick Broadway, Peter Malik, Ben Wallace, and our guest host, Jared, aka Project COE. This interview has been uploaded for archival purposes and may be used with permission. We hope you enjoy. All right. Well,、um, Tom, thank you so much.、Uh, like Nick said,、uh, this for me personally, this is,、uh, this is, I already told the panel, but this is、uh, a check mark on、uh, my bucket list.、Uh, <laughs> always,、uh, always wanted to have the opportunity to speak with you. You were、uh, quite the inspiration to me,、uh, both professionally and、uh, personally.、Um, so, just give you a quick backdrop of who we are. So, Project COE. Uh, believe it or not, is actually COE is, stands for Council of Elders, which was from Masters of the Universe, believe it、oh、or not. Oh my gosh. Yes, <laughs> of course. And so,、uh, yeah, so like I said, you've been influencing me in one way or another for literally my, my whole life. And、uh, yeah, so I started up,、uh, started up the site.、Uh, <laughs> my goodness, probably. There it、uh, is. There, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you my address.、Uh, you can shoot that over to me.、Um, uh, for those that、uh, may have missed it or got cut off, I had asked Tom、um, what your, your proudest pre Sega moment was. Now go ahead. No more interruptions, I promise. <laughs> okay. Well, as I was saying, you know,、uh, I was very proud of what we did in the early 70s, reviving the Barbie billion plus dollar business, still is today. But I think my proudest thing was the launch of He Man Masters of the Universe and、uh, making it a strong brand and getting the television show up and running and giving it away free to stations all across America. And in return, got some advertising time back that we could either use or we could sell. We actually sold an awful lot of it. We ended up making a profit off of the television show, which we did not expect to be. And something that always,、um, always sort of I wanted to ask you with that was. I know at the time, Star Wars, you know, in terms of like、yes. male, male figures, it was, it was dominating the, the, the industry. And this is something that you're going to hear at least me say multiple times with respect to your career was at the time, and I remember it well,、uh, was that, you know, no one could, could do this. No one was going to be able to beat,、uh, you know, what, what, what was being done with Star Wars. And it's sort of, Reminisces like to what everyone was saying with Nintendo at the time. You know, Nintendo's got 90 plus、uh, percent market share. It's impossible. No one can do it. And I just wondered, like, as a business leader, wh- what did you do to motivate your people to sort of say, like, well, yes, we can do it? Or did you not even, was that not even your goal with Masters? Was it just, you know, we want to just make this successful and see what happens? No, it was very much our, our goal to、uh, equal. You know, Hasbro was our main competitor at the time, and they had bought Kenner and therefore had the Star Wars、uh, brand. And in fact, the chairman of Mattel at the time said to me, Well, it's nice you're launching this little male action brand called He Man and Masters of the Universe, but you'll never be as important as Star Wars because you don't have a movie or a TV show and you can't get one. And my response to him was, You want to bet? And, <laughs> and of course, I didn't know the television world that well. So I, I、uh, hired a guy named Eddie Smarden, who had worked on television broadcasting for years. He was an old Ogilvy and Mather hand. And he really、uh, got us together with Group W Westinghouse and Filmation uh, Studio, uh, Lou Scheimer's、uh, animation house in Los Angeles. And、uh, we put a deal together where Mattel put up three and a half million dollars, and Group W Westinghouse, with all of their stations across the United States, put up three and a half million dollars. And for seven million dollars in those days, we ended up doing 65 half hour episodes of He Man Masters of the U- Universe and getting it on air across the, the, the US and eventually across the world. And that really helped propel He Man into becoming、uh, an equal. To Star Wars, which was something that we'd all hoped for and inspired uh, for. Uh, and certainly the creative team at, at Mattel 
really had a feeling that this could become very, very important, and they were right. Terrific. And um, well, we'll go ahead and dive right now here into the Sega era. Um, uh, we, we do have a, a list of questions here. And Patrick, you are first up. Do you need a I, second to prepare, Patrick? Uh, I should I should be good. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. I'm, I'm on That's the tech right. end. So I'm just Thank you for doing all <laughs> this, Patrick. managing all the we videos and it. trying to not crash again. So, all right. So, um, <laughs> Sega used, Sega used a ton of star power to promote the Genesis, such as Joe Montana, Michael Jackson. I was curious what your strategy was to target them and what your market lo- and what market you looked to reach. Yeah, oh, sure. Well, it was all part of the, remember the overall strategy, uh, overriding strategy was, hey, let's leave Nintendo, the young kids business. They own it. They have 95% share of the six to, or nine to 13 year old business. Let's go after uh, older teens and college age plus males initially. And therefore, it was important to have people like Joe Montana, uh, David Robinson, Tommy Lasorda Baseball, you know, have these characters that were well known by an older audience as part of our our uh, our gang, if you will. And, uh, and of course, at one point, Joe Montana football was outselling Madden football, which was uh, really spectacular. And Joe actually, uh, he lives near me. He lived at the time near me here in, in Northern California. And uh, our kids played together and he became a, a, a friend. And he really, really helped uh, the brand because he was willing to to do appearances, to visit say, to visit retailers. Remember, there was no internet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that, it was an important part of our strategy. And of course, Michael Jackson, the same thing. I mean, he's a huge, huge star, uh, music star. And, and uh, he loved Sega. And our our head of marketing, Al Nielsen, had a very good rapport with with uh, Michael Jackson, and uh, visited the Netherlands Ranch a number of times. Yeah, and uh, speaking of Michael Jackson, I was curious. Uh, Michael Jackson's collaborators, such as Brad Buxer, even had a hand at composing for Sonic Three, or at least brought on at the time. I was curious how that came about. If you could talk about that, um, I seem to recall signing some agreement where we can't talk about what music oh. Michael Jackson <laughs> provided the Sonic series. <laughs> I gotcha. Fair enough. We will and, take the hint. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, all the all the great collaborators. We definitely thank for bringing them on because uh, I guess I guess seeing that I guess that the cool guys, you know, the the people that we were interested back in the day on, it's like, oh, let's check out the system. You know, it's like let's let's see, this is this is a cool thing to bring us on, so to make us sort of cool and popular is that we're in this pop sort of thing. So that's really cool that you did that yeah and you know he was one of a number of people remember we were located here in uh, redwood city and our r d group used to have visitors all the time come in and, and playing games uh, you know we did just pop in the the whole mets baseball team used to pop in oh, when they were coming here to, to visit uh, and play against the san francisco giants uh, and michael jackson would jo- drop in Joe Montana would drop in, and lots of famous people just came in to play uh, Sega Genesis games while they were being developed. Actually, they weren't even released yet. Oh, geez! Heck of a game party right there. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, And then, kind of talking about the uh, bridge between the Genesis and Saturn, you know, you had the Sega CD and 32X systems, and they those two received a lot of critically acclaimed titles, a lot of good software like Sonic CD, Knuckles Chaotix on the 32X. Star Wars Arcade and uh, Night Trap, which many people know about today. Oh, nice. Um, the, oh, you got Sonic CD still. Great yeah, game. Amazing. You're, you're mentioning things that just happened to be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You just got people a shelf of We set this up, but we didn't. Uh, I, I actually just grabbed this uh, the other day and had it on my desk here to be reminiscing about it. Oh, that's terrific. That's probably worth a pretty penny, but I'm sure you wouldn't want to be getting rid of that anytime soon. So, <laughs> no. Um, so the Saturn, when it launched, um, as, as you know, it launched without a ton of, of greater critically acclaimed games. It had Panzer Dragoon, it had uh, Daytona, but it did, really didn't have a lot when it came out. Do you think many of those software, many of those games that came out in the 32X and the Sega CD should have been saved for the Saturn or at the very least ported to the Saturn in some fashion when it launched? Well, I think I've, I've gone on the record a number of times saying that, uh, we were forced in the U.S. to launch earlier than we wanted to. We were originally we were going to launch in the, in the fall. We were forced to launch immediately in, in, in June. And we didn't have enough software. Hell, we didn't even have enough hardware. We couldn't ship enough Saturn hardware to retailers 
to give a, an average store four to six pieces of hardware on the shelf. And believe me, that caused a terrible, terrible uh, backlash. I mean, I, I, I used to have very good relationships with all of the retailers, but when we couldn't supply the hardware, I had a number of guys who were good friends of mine in the retail world basically swear at me and say they weren't going to support Sega any longer because we couldn't, we were, we launched, but we couldn't launch properly without enough hardware. And then certainly we did not have enough or the right uh, software, the enough, enough games, enough good games to support it. And, and so that was, it kind of doomed us to fail with Saturn from the beginning because of yeah. those, uh, those mistakes. And talking about the software decisions, um, of course, some of those titles that were only on 32X, only on Sega CD, and of course, a number of titles that were in Japan and in Europe, but not in North America throughout the lifespan of the Saturn. Um, were those decisions sort of out of the control of Sega of America? Was that something that came down from uh, your higher ups at Sega of Japan? Were you guys trying to get more of those games here yeah. in North America? Yeah, it was a very strange time for me. Uh, you know, I had been given a pretty much a free hand for years and years to build Sega and build Genesis and and to some degree Mega help Mega Drive in in Europe, and and then all of a sudden with the the Saturn decisions, uh, I wasn't. They didn't listen any longer. <laughs> I guess is the way to put it kindly, and and so uh, a lot of those decisions from from Japan were 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 the wrong decisions and we we desperately needed more and better software and uh we didn't get it for a long time huh. that's actually a really good segue uh you did tom <laughs> into my question <laughs> uh, so that's perfect so you set it up um and you have gone on record many times talking about um Basically, it's generally understood that the Saturn was caught up in the middle of disagreements and differences in philosophy between SOA and SOJ. Uh, you were very vocal, and even now, about not wanting to launch the Saturn early, yet you were basically, they forced your hand. And that action seemed to have ripple effects on many of the aspects of its time on the market. And so if we were to, this is what I don't know, and this is what I would like to know, if we were to step back, Taking into account the majority U.S. market share that you that you fought for during the Genesis era, and the fact that you were currently at the time operating operating at a deficit um, with with a long game plan, you know, uh, if you'd been allowed the continued freedom that you had with the Genesis, could you walk us through your ideal five year plan for launching and supporting the Saturn uh, in the U.S. and competing with? Um, the new Sony PlayStation and the yet to come Ultra 64, like over the, the next five years. What what was your game plan? You're taxing my memory. Uh, <laughs> needless, <Yes. laughs> needless to say, we, we wanted to launch our original plan on Saturn was to wait until the fall to launch when we'd have more hardware and more software available and we would be able to get more titles developed by ourselves in uh, Redwood City, but also grab more titles from, from Japan. You know, it was, it was kind of a strange situation. Here we were, as you mentioned, we had a, a leading share of market in the, in the United States, uh, 55%, and, it, at, and in Japan they never got over, I don't think, 12%, and yet they were forcing the, the decisions on how to, how to uh, launch this, uh, this, this hardware and software range. Uh, and that, that's sort of a, I guess that sort of sums up the the difference in philosophy. You, you'd think that the market had the bigger market share make the decisions that had gotten them the bigger market share. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's not what happened. Uh, so, you know, we would have had enough hardware, obviously, to fill all of the, the retailers' needs and get shelf space, adequate shelf space everywhere. And we would have had enough software to have a, a bigger presence and get some of those titles that uh, did exist or about to exist in Japan, get them into the marketplace at the same time. And, you know, it, it would be it would have been the same kind of game plan as we would have done very aggressive. Uh, Sony, who was our friend up until then, <laughs> and uh, they were you know, our enemy at what, quickly. <laughs> at what time does that uh, at what time does that transfer over into profit, though, like um because basically your long game was trying to get as much of the market as you possibly can, because then you have a huge install base to sell software to. Right. And of course, J Japan is playing it more conservative. They want cash reserves. They don't want to operate at a deficit. Of course, I, I was explaining to the other guys, this is coming off of a huge economic recession in the 80s. 
they're playing things a little bit more conservative and not really understanding that you're just kind of biding your time and trying to build up as much market share as you can in the US to kind of flip the table with Nintendo. Uh, and I guess Sony PlayStation comes along and they're like, they're like a variable, you know? So, so at what, at what point does that plan turn into profit though? Well, you know, you're talking, you, you, we made a hell of a lot of money for Sega Japan off of Genesis and Mega Drive. Remember mm -hmm. when I started at, uh, at Sega, I think the market cap of the Sega Corporation was about a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the late nine, uh, the mid nineties, it was seven and a half billion dollars. So we'd increased the shareholders value seven plus times in a, in a, four or five year period of time. Mm -hmm. So you'd think that the uh, guys in senior management who owned a lot of the stock uh, would have understood that and would have understood that that what we were doing was going to benefit the corporation much more than a one year bottom line loss. So mm -hmm. anyway, back to back to your, your, your question. I mean, it would have it would have been uh, let's segment the market again. Let's let's do the let's have the proper amount of sports titles. Let's have a proper amount of racing titles. Let's have a proper amount of fighting titles and uh, uh, RPG and, and strategy games on the on the Saturn uh, by the fall uh, and and launch in that in that manner and keep doing that uh, year after year after year and be very aggressive against our friends at, at Sony, who, of course, had one of our ex guys, Steve Race running running marketing there did so lose? how did this how did the selection of the titles work uh coming into the saturn uh because of the ips that you selected for the saturn uh as compared to the genesis with the genesis you had a lot of disney games you had the sega sports games that just dominated the market and you very much like to compete with nintendo and that really translated into the growth that you had in the market during the genesis and the mega drive era but with the IP selection that you had for the Saturn, it was IPs like Black Fire, Gen War, and Bug. Uh, what was the selection criteria for that? Uh, because uh, those kind of games that came into North America, they didn't hit well with consumers. Um, what was that selection criteria like? Well, it wasn't a. It wasn't a criteria. We were given. We were told what we were, what we could have. And uh, in large part, and so we didn't have a choice. I mean, we didn't need, obviously, we didn't even have Sonic, for God's sake, initially. And that was a, a huge, huge mistake. And we didn't have FIFA soccer, and we didn't have uh, Joe Montana football. Imagine what it could look like in, well, all of the sports games today. I just marvel at how they look on, a, on either a PlayStation or an Xbox. But anyway, uh, that wasn't our decision. <clears throat> So that all come from Japan or like, did they tell you, Hey, produce this software. Don't produce this software. Is that basically what, what basically, that was like? Basically that's what happened. Wow. Okay. Well, Peter, I think you have next bite here. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So um, it's been discussed before that you were a big proponent in getting a dedicated video game convention started, which of course became uh, E3. And I was curious what your involvement with E3 has been since then and your thoughts on the convention um, as it's grown over the years to become more of a fan expo rather than just an industry. Um, e E3 at the time E3. was a very important step for the industry. You'll recall before E3, we were all running to CES show in Las Vegas in early January. And the reason that I got so annoyed at CES, first of all, they treated the video game industry like dirt. They've had us in the very back of the hall. Uh, we were actually behind. You had to walk through the porn section first to get to uh, the Ooh. video game section. Wow. <laughs> wow. And one year, one year, we were actually out the back door in a tent. And I think I've told this story before. And in the tent, it was raining in January, that and the tent was leaking over our Genesis displays. And I basically said, "That's it. We're never coming back to see us again. We're going to start our own show." We'd we'd had a mini show before that, uh, just for ourselves and uh, and retailers. And we held held those events in Silverado, and I think we held them in uh, in Florida one year. Uh, so I knew that the retailers were going, were going to like this, and we we got convinced EA and, uh, and uh, uh, a number of the other uh, software game makers to, to join with us. 
And initially, of course, Nintendo is, is, is typical. They didn't want to do it initially, but eventually they, they got on board too when they heard how much the, the retail world liked the idea of our own video game show. So initially it was very important. It was a very, very important show. We actually did a lot of business there. And of course, you, you got an awful lot of PR out of it because we were right there in Los Angeles and uh, a lot of media people came over and a lot of celebrities came over. So it was very important initially. Um, I have not kept, tra I haven't gone in a couple of years now, but it, it, I've seen it diminish and I've heard from uh, friends at EA that it's no longer that important. Uh, they all have their own private meetings with uh, retailers. Retailers aren't that important anymore. They're doing most of their business online. Mm. So, so I think it's much less important. I know it's much less important today. And it seems like it's almost they do a little bit for PR purposes, and that's about it. And I think that that's the way of a lot of industry shows have gone. They've just become less important as uh, as our ability to communicate via via like we are right now. We can do the same thing with with uh, in, important influencers in the in the industry. So so I, I know it's not as important today as it. Okay. All right. Um... One thing I was curious about is uh, during the Genesis lifespan, there was a various amount of RPGs that were released at the time on the system. In comparison, many Sega RPGs for both the Sega CD and Saturn, such as stuff like Magic Knight, Ray Earth, and Dragon Force, that have extensive voice acting and span many discs seem to have been halted by third, been handled by third-party studios such as Working Designs, or just released in, or just not released in North America at all. I was curious if there was if there if that. I was curious if this had something to do with Sega seeing RPGs as having a limited audience, had poor sales performance in the past, or you guys just didn't have enough bandwidth to support the releases for them? Uh, you know, I honestly, I thought we did do a number of reasonably good RPGs, so I'm, 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 I'm forgetting about this, or, uh, or it's, it's not striking a chord with my memory mm. cell. Uh, you probably should ask Al Nielsen that question. I, I thought we did uh, uh, release a number of good RPGs. And uh, yes, it's a limited audience, but it also was an older audience, which, which was something we desired to be stronger with. Yeah, I just meant in terms like on, on the Saturn with like uh, like some of the uh, like some of the ones that were like released earlier but didn't get released earlier were handled by different studios like uh, working designs of that in that nature. Yeah, I, I, I don't recall. I gotcha. Fair enough. For roughly a decade, you know, Sega, Nintendo, they were the only in the Western market for video games. And that provide you guys at Sega, you guys had a pretty singular focus in terms of battling for market share, knowing who your com real competitors were. But then in the early to mid 90s, it kind of became a little more crowded. You had the Atari coming out with the Jaguar, uh, the 3DO came out, Sony is, was working on their thing. It, be it became a little more crowded than it, it had been, uh, especially as things were transitioning uh, into the 3D world. Um, young consumers found it difficult to keep track of all the available options on the horizon. And uh, kind of a two-parter question here for you. With all the new competitors coming up, how did you market through all of the noise? And at what point did you guys realize that Sony would be the chief threat after all? Yeah. Well, frankly, we... We, did, we didn't think that Jaguar or 3DO was going to be successful. We had many, many meetings with Trip Hawkins on 3DO, and we were actually trying to figure out a way of working together. Uh, and, of course, you know, he's, he was really a, a bright, bright guy. But that machine was just too expensive. It was just way, way too expensive to, to be successful. So we couldn't figure out a way of, of doing anything together. Uh, and, and, therefore, it really wasn't that much of a, of a com competitor. We had a very good relationship with Sony, as I think has been uh, reported. Uh, we, Olaf Olafson and I became good friends. Um, the, he asked us to help his de development group in Santa Monica develop uh, video games. And of course, the platform at the time was, was Sega CD. And uh, we did. So my Joe Miller and his guys would go down there and help the, uh, the Sony guys uh, develop uh, video games and uh, uh, for the launch of Sega CD uh, I think right at the beginning they did three and we did three uh, and it was a, a really good good relationship and at some point we started talking about instead of being a competitor joining forces and doing one hardware platform that would be whatever you want to call it the Sony Sega or the Sega C Sony platform and uh, Olaf liked the idea and I liked the idea uh, Olaf's boss, Mickey Shuloff, liked the idea. We went to Japan, and J Sony Japan like, seemed to like the idea. 
we went to Sega and uh, Nakayama did not like the idea and said, why should we help Sony uh, become a video game company? So that was the end of that. And at that time, it was very clear <laughs> that Sony was going to be a major competitor. So from that point on, when uh, the business deal sort of faded away after Nakayama decided, no, nope, no, thanks. It, was it pretty much immediately when you guys figured, all right, well, they're going to be our our big competition now. They're going to be the other big boy here. Yeah, you could see it coming. Uh, mm. and, and of course, uh, to uh, make noises and get into the video game business as well. So you could see that one coming too. So it's wow. going to be two major corporations coming uh, into the market very shortly. So just to clarify, you saw Microsoft coming in all the way back in the mid to early 90s. I would say it was more of the mid 90s, uh, probably okay. around, around 95. Uh, because they actually were interested in somehow working together. They, they never contacted me, but mm -hmm. we heard the stories of them uh, working with, with others, working with uh, other, trying to work with other, other Japanese companies, uh, chip makers and what have you. Gotcha. Oh, that's interesting stuff to know about, especially with, so that was Microsoft. They almost teamed up with Sega. Is that what you were getting at there? That was the rumor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> interesting. Got it. And then do you know more about that or, or why that sort of faded out? I, I really don't because I okay. was not included in those discussions. Sega right now, on. there is one funny part of that, though. When, yeah. when, uh, when uh, Jim Clark, uh, who was running Silicon Graphics at the time before he launched Netscape, uh, he, he called me up and he said, hey, you got to come over here to Silicon Graphics. It was very close by, actually. And take a look at this chipset we have. A guy named Jensen Wang has developed it, and we think it's going to be terrific for video games. Jensen Wang, by the way, is the founder of NVIDIA now. Uh, and oh, so wow. uh, we, I went over there with Joe Miller, and we really liked what the capabilities of this chipset was. And so we asked uh, uh, Sega Japan, Nakayama, and, uh, and I think Sato-san at the time to come over and take a look at it. And they did. And they said, well, yeah, gee, that's great graphics, great capabilities, but that chip is too big. And when we, in manufacturing, there's going to be too much waste, and therefore it's going to cost us too much to utilize it, so we can't do it. So mm -hmm. I reported that to, to Jim, and uh, Jim said, well, what the hell do I do now? And I said, well, Jim, there's this other company up north and outside Seattle you might want to talk to. <laughs> and, and, of course, he went up. Yeah, it's wow. Different. That's you got, nuts. They shut you down quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. I don't know if you're the right. I don't know if you're the right person to ask about this, but I'll I'll shoot anyway. Uh, you know, it it seems to me. So at that same time, Sega, Sega is the one who pioneered like the 3D graphics. I mean, with Virtua Fighter, with the Model One arcade games, it was like the first time as a kid that I ever saw anything like that. So you've got these amazing uh, 3D games, dynamic 3D games in the arcade, like Virtual Fighter and Virtual Racing. And the next obvious step, you know, seems that those will come home on a on you know home console because that was always the thing, you know, trying to get the arcade experience in the home. Yeah. And 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 I mean, Sega was the one who pioneered this stuff. So it just seems to me like they were a little caught off guard by Sony's decision to go all in on 3D, like just 3D in the home. Whereas with the, with the way the Saturn architecture was designed, it was almost mostly intended to be 2D and yeah. have 3D as like kind of a little bit of a, like it could do 3D, but by rendering 2D sprites. So how was it that Sega was caught off guard in that way? Like how, how did they not see that that was the future, that what they were already doing in the arcade needed to be done one for one or you know as close as you could get it in the home yeah that's that's a great question and i i completely agree with you in fact i i i'm sorry i'm not in my basement where i have 200 sega genesis games and a whole bunch of saturn games and a whole oh, bunch wow. of game gear games and a whole bunch of cd-rom games but i also have a virtual fighter arcade machine and oh, wow. uh, i i love it you know it's it, that's such a uh, anyway uh, yeah, that seems like it would, is, would have been a natural to move that direction onto the uh, next platform. And I think the problem was the architecture of the Saturn made that very difficult. And uh, that was one of the, I think that was also, if I, you know, again, in my memory, it's been so long now. But I think that was one of the, one of the objections Joe Miller had about the Saturn architecture as well. Was it what, he had a couple objections. One, I think, was the 3D. Uh, you couldn't do 3D that easily. And the second 
was he really wanted uh, the next hardware platform after Genesis Mega Drive. To, to, it was the beginning of the internet, and he really wanted good internet connectivity. And that was a big gripe of his. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we didn't do it. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, that's the thing with Sega is they're always pioneering new, they're on the edge of everything new, like the internet, but way before the rest of the, you know, the rest of the public is ready for it, you know? Um, so, so you're basically saying that they were just focusing on uh, maybe a few other little things to, to try to focus on having it do rather than just going all in with the 3d. Yeah. I think, by the way, Joe was the guy who, uh, when we, you remember when we did the, uh, the Sega channel mm -hmm. with, uh, with time Warner. And, oh man. Uh, Thanks a lot. That was yep. awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, it was it was really terrific. But but <laughs> poor Joe, I thought this was a simple thing to do. What do I know? You know, I'm not a technical <laughs> guy. And I thought, you, you know, a cable box. So we just do a connection to a cable box. Mm -hmm. Joe called me down to the R&D group one day and he said, look at what I have in this room. And there must have been, I don't know, 150 different cable boxes <laughs> in the room. <laughs> and he said, every one of these requires a different way of interfacing with it and you want me to do this i've got to figure out how to do it with 150 different machines they're not the same in any city and uh of course he was right and he but he did it and it was just a it was a great effort and it was uh, again probably obviously before it's time uh to have people playing uh, uh via a cable a cable system in their in their home but it did work and a lot of people really loved it yes that that was that's amazing i i think that that's one of my favorite things that one are the just the internet connectivity with the Netlink stuff, just so fascinating, especially during that time where nothing was done like it. So yeah. it was really cool. Yeah, Sega really pushed for that each console generation until they got it with the uh, PSO on the Dreamcast. And then it was like, boom, the, the yeah. market was ready for it. And that just took off. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the different ways to play games with different people online was just, oh, it's just amazing. But they were pushing for it since the Genesis, you know? It was like... Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, all that said, though, around the time of the Saturn, the internet really was still very nascent. Um, and so a lot of folks, uh, myself included, got a lot of our news about what was going on, you know, in the industry and the, and the different consoles through print media. So journalism, video game journalism was quite big at the time. And at yes. the time, there was, there was just a really huge bias in the media towards the PlayStation and again, eventually towards uh, the Nintendo 64. And they really didn't look on the Saturn very favorably, whereas, of course, with the Genesis, it was very different. Um, and I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, at the time, Sega was aware that, you know, it, you know, they weren't exactly being treated super kindly in the in the uh, press uh, with the Saturn. And if so, you know, what were the things that you guys tried to do to combat that? Yeah, that, it, that's a really good observation and, and a very strange one because I thought, uh, certainly during Genesis era, we had great relationships with the print media and the print press, and and they were very important to us because, as you say, that's where the players got their information from, and they they, they rated the video games, and it was very important to get a good rating from the printed press. Uh, we worked very hard to to ensure that and wind and dine those guys. And uh, and I thought we had a very good relationship. So I, I don't know quite why it all changed. Remember, I left shortly after the launch of Saturn. So I'm not quite sure why that uh, why that all changed. And uh, was it something that Sega of America did or was it something that Sega of Japan did to the printed press that that uh, changed them to being uh, enemies of Sega? I don't know. We'll have to ask him. <laughs> Call him up. <laughs> gotcha. Um, uh, in the time of the Saturn, and it was rumored, and I can't stress the word rumor enough, so hoping maybe you'd know somebody, rumored that Sony was nefarious for causing multi-platform Saturn games to come out several months after they were finished uh, so that the PlayStation port of the game could come out first. So, for example, say there's a game that's said to come out for both consoles and the developer finishes the Saturn port in January, but the Sony PlayStation port still being worked on, that needs another six months. And um, Sony would tell the developer, well, don't release the Saturn game yet, wait until the PlayStation one's done and release it first. Uh, my question to you, would Sony pressure third parties 
into delaying Saturn ports to make their console appear to be ahead and getting games first before Saturn. Oh, sure. Uh, sure. I, I'm, I, I heard the same rumors. I don't have any facts to, to back it up, but I'm sure that they would have done the, that uh, uh, to, to have an advantage uh, over us. So you believe it probably happened then? I believe it. We'll have to ask Interesting. Them. We would, yes. <laughs> that would definitely be a good question to them. I appreciate you uh, sort of giving your input on that, though. Uh, definitely something I've been wondering about. <clears throat> Did that frustrate you at all, like, seeing that happen? <laughs> like, Well, of course. Part of the dirty tricks that went on in the video game battles. So torches, pitchforks, so and everything. I'm sorry, Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I cut in between there. So in 1999, you told the Wall Street Journal that you believe no one could successfully market the Saturn. Uh, is this solely because of the hardware, which I know you really didn't care for the architecture, or do you think a better library of software and games could have made it competitive? Oh, sure. Sure. It wasn't just the, the shortage of hardware and the fact I thought it could have been a better system. And, and that was really Joe Miller's thoughts, not mine, because I, as I said, I'm not a technical guy. Uh, but it was clearly the the lack of great great games. If we'd had great games, at least we would have had a fighting chance. But uh, without the without great games and with a, the limited amount of hardware we had and pissing off all of the retailers, that was what I meant in that Wall Street Journal article long, long, long ago. Yeah, sure. Okay. And speaking of great games, uh, in late '96, uh, you released the three free game pack, uh, which was uh, Virtua Fighter 2, Virtua Cop, and Daytona USA, which are very much great games. They're flagship titles. A uh, similar promotion was done in late '95. Uh, tell us about what went into this bundle decision. Uh, again, just trying to offer great value and great product, uh, great products. So that we'd have some advantage uh, and consumers would want it. The players would, would gravitate toward that. I do have the, I should have brought that up here. I don't have it. And I have that in my, in my basement uh, game collection, but I have those, those products. And uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was really good to have a combination like that available for the consumer. That really, that was great value for the dollars. Oh, definitely. It was a really good variety. You got to really try out a different uh, type of game uh, selection there. I even have one of the old retail displays. Now, this isn't a Saturn one, but I have a Genesis retail setup in my basement with the television connected to it with a automatic changer so you can rotate through. You may remember seeing this at retail. You could rotate through six different games and at retail and play each of them in, in any order you wanted. Uh, again, f for as long as you wanted or as long as the retailers would let the, the player stand in front of their display. But uh, yeah, so that was uh, another little trick we had. Was that a hard decision to make though? Like uh, if we're going back to the three free games, um, often with the, you know, often with video games, there's the whole razor and blade yeah. style marketing where you, you, you try to get the console, you barely make a profit. If anything, you might lose money, but you're trying to sell the software. And here you're giving away three flagship titles with a console. So like um, what, what did that, what was that like, you know, in the boardroom meetings, you know, uh, was that a difficult decision to make? Did, uh, did Sega of Japan, you know, give you a hard time about, it, or did they just say, you know, go ahead and do whatever needs to be done? Well, it, it is a difficult decision. As you say, you know, you're giving up a lot of separate profit for if you, if you've been able to successfully sell each of those games on their own, you'd obviously have more profit than just combining them into one product and selling it. So uh, it, it is a difficult decision, but at the time we really needed to do something. You know, mm -hmm. we, we needed to, to offer better value and, and try to get more players onto the system. So, yeah. I know it was a success because I hear plenty of people saying that's how they came to the console through that yeah. three game yeah. offer. So, yeah. I'm, I, I was just surprised that uh, SOJ was like signed off on that considering they didn't even want you to pack in Sonic into the Genesis, you know? Well, they didn't want us to do the, the three pack either. So, you, right. know, you know, some things they let us do and other things that eventually in the <laughs> 95, 96, they, they stopped us from doing an awful lot of stuff. Gotcha. I wanted to, uh, just to ask, I just, I recently graduated, got my MBA and, uh, believe it or not, but a lot of the, the tactics that you use from a, a marketing and business, uh, context are actually being taught now, which is really funny, uh, to see your name, uh, sort of in print there talking about Sagan, <laughs> you know, 
you can tell i mean just by talking to you just to see your body language you can really tell that you know you're annoyed by by what <laughs> happened um and i'm just i'm i'm curious you know all the success that you've had you know you mentioned barbie i know there was hot wheels there's masters of the universe you come in you got genesis you're crushing nintendo at a game that everyone tells you can't be done what did you do from a leadership standpoint when you come back from your meetings with Japan and you realize, like you see the writings on the wall, um, what, what do you do from a leadership standpoint to sort of motivate your staff? Because it can't just be you. And I can only imagine like with my teams and stuff like that, the position that you must have been in must have been exceedingly challenging. And I just was curious, just from a leadership standpoint, what, what did you try to do to, to motivate the troops to say, you know, we do still have a chance? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And by the way, I, I am somewhat aware that in MBA programs around the country that they are using uh, episodes of Council Wars book or chapters of Council Wars book in their in the trend. In fact, I, I have to give a lecture at University of Kentucky, I think, next month uh, via Zoom. Uh, and I've done it at Vanderbilt University and I've done it at uh, University of Arizona, University of Wisconsin. So I know that it is being being used. And I'm, I'm quite happy about that. And I'm frankly surprised. But anyway, to your to your question, um, you know, all the things we did in the early days at SIGA, I get way too much credit for because it really was the team of people coming up with let's do this, let's do that, let's let's be, do more aggressive advertising. Yeah, so it was really, you know, it was Al Nielsen and Diane Fornassier and Paul Rio and Joe Miller. And it was this team of people I had that was a very diverse team, a lot of females in senior management positions, which no video game company had back in those days. Ellen Beth and Buskirk. Uh, anyway. Uh, Michael and Christine Risley, all these great people came up with the ideas that we put together as a strategy. And then I'd go to Japan and fight it out <laughs> in the boardroom there saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make fun of Nintendo and advertising. And they all practically ran out of the room. Uh, we're going to lower the price of the hardware. We're going to put Sonic the Hedgehog in instead of uh, Altered Beast. All of these decisions weren't just mine. These were recommendations that came from the team. So the team was terribly important. And when I and early on when we were successful and Nakayama said, okay, do what you do, what you think is right. The team was very happy and very excited. But later on in the, in the late, in the 95 period of time on, when I'd come back and say, well, this is what we, we have to do. Or I'd get a phone call in the middle of the night. You're going to introduce Saturn in June, not in September. Um, this was tough because it was tough to communicate to the team. And I, I would obviously do it and say, well, we're going to, this is the way it's going to be, and we got to try to do our best that we can. But I did. I started losing people. Uh, you know, I, I'm a number of a number of my key team left before I left, so uh, they saw the writing on the wall uh, probably before I did. Uh, but it, it, it was difficult. You know, when you have a strategy that everybody buys into, life is good and it can be pretty easy. When you have a when you don't have a strategy and you're just ordered to do things without really having a strategy life becomes very hard. And uh, so it was a, it was a tough period of time. And that's why I left. Yeah. And it was, I think it's apparent now in hindsight that really for Saturn could have succeeded quite well under your continued leadership and on, on, you know, it, it succeeded quite well in Japan Yes, with them doing things their way. But, um, but it needed to be one of those split things where there were two different sides of the coin, you know, and, you know, and, and we love Saturn despite all of this, you know, we, we came to it and we've stayed with it despite all of this. And we love the console. We, we love a lot of the games, but I do think that you had all of this forward momentum that was just continuing to build. And, uh, and then it just kind of, uh, you know, it just stopped dead in its tracks and, you know, they kind of, you know, I, and, and I'm not trying to make you out to be a victim, but definitely <laughs> your, your hands were tied behind your back to a certain extent, to, you know, to, to a certain degree. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't, I don't feel like a victim. I just feel like, uh, you know, I, I kind of blame myself. I always, I always say to myself, why couldn't I convince them of some of these things? What did I communicate in? How did I communicate incorrectly? Why was I not able to let them see the light, you know? Or, uh, and, and so I do, I do blame myself for, for not being con, con persuasive enough, I guess. Uh, Anyway, 
the truth is there were more moving parts at that time you know i mean it wasn't just sega and nintendo anymore that's true. and so the the market i mean to be fair the entire games industry was changing at that time radically uh yes. in terms of what peter said with the uh, the internet and uh hardware and new competitors entering the market and it was just like the wild west yeah it was it was a difficult period of time but I had a great time while I did it. It was a wonderful six years. And, uh, and uh, you know, I learned an awful, as you probably know. I mean, I fell in love with the, what video game technology could do in terms of involving players and, and uh, having fun and being better than what other alternatives of play were. And I wanted to take that, that uh, knowledge and, and apply it to educational uh, curriculum and make uh, educational curriculum as fun and interesting as a video game. I still believe in that and uh, still in some ways working on that. Absolutely. Now, I can't do an interview with you in this ter current time period without plugging the Console Wars documentary time, which you were featured in quite a bit, uh, released last year. And if people at home want to watch it and learn more about Tom's time in the Genesis era, um, you know that that is a i believe it's on amazon prime video and i'm sure it's available on other platforms it, as well. it's available on cbs all access for sure mm -hmm. yeah, frankly. <laughs> gotcha uh one thing that we wanted to ask i think our stream is done just due to time constraints but while we got you on the line here uh, uh peter i think this is your last question uh just about reflecting on the saturn then and the saturn now so i'll kind of let you take it away peter well here in north america obviously um, and I'm sure that a lot of the times when you've had to talk about the Saturn, you know, it, it's never really been anything really positive. And so I'm just curious if you had, um, uh, first of all, any positive uh, memories about the Saturn in that time frame? And how do you feel about it now being such a unique and, um, you know, well-regarded retro console? You were breaking up a little bit there, at least at my end. Uh, you know, I, I, I frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you guys are doing this, you know, that you're keeping interest in the, in the Saturn uh, alive. And I, and I frankly wasn't aware there was a, that big of an audience of people who still uh, loved it. But I guess this whole retro movement uh, in video games is, uh, is, uh, you know, when, when Blake Harris came to me, what it was five years ago and said, Hey, I want to do a book on the time you were at Sega fighting Nintendo and Genesis versus uh, NES and Super NES. I said, gee, Blake, there's probably 200 people in the world who care. And he said, no, you're wrong. There's a huge audience. And he turned out to be right. And I think, again, in what you guys are doing, it's a much bigger audience than I was aware of. So thanks to you. Thanks for keeping the interest up. Um, I'm sorry. That's my phone going off. Um, and now I forgot your question. <laughs> Well, I mean, nowadays, like, there are Saturn games that go for hundreds, some thousands of dollars, sometimes because of how rare they are, but there are even some common Saturn games that fetch 80, more than $100 on eBay. This is a very sought-after retro game console, um, partially due to its rarity, but it also due to how everything, people who are into retro games really like the look of Saturn games and the yeah. types of games that it has yeah. to offer. I mean, reflecting on it now, like, what are your, what's your kind of general reaction to what you experienced in 1995 and seeing now in 2021 this giant amount of people who still like it and have such hail it as having such a high value both in the monetary sense and for people who just like the console's library well it's great to hear and i guess i should go down in my basement and start offering them on ebay because god knows i've got everything that we had through the through through 96 at least yeah for real i, I just spent like 800 dollars on Maginite ray earth a couple months ago so you'll oh, make some good gosh. money Oh my gosh. Actually sign them first and then they'll be worth like 10 times. As much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But, well, uh, Tom, I, okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. That, that's it. We just wanted to say thank you so very much. Uh, like I said at the beginning of this, this really for all of us, uh, this is a bucket list moment. Um, and, and this was, we actually gained a lot of insight here and, and um, you're just, you're a very, very, very generous and kind man. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. And I tell you right now, there are a lot of Sega Saturn fans out there and um, slowly but surely, I think people are coming to realize sort of exactly what you said at the beginning of this, that, you know, there was potential there. There really, really was. There's a lot of so, new fans too. People who missed it the first time around and now they're realizing um, the mistake they made. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah.
That's great to hear. So yeah. thanks for joining, Tom. And we're going to wrap this up. So um, thank you all, all right. for watching. And um, go check out Take the car one. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very, thank you thank very, you very much. much. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah, thank Take you very much. much. <laughs>